one uh, future GRP is one of Warwick's 10 interdisciplinary global research priorities. And this programme supports cross-departmental collaborations, enabling Warwick researchers to work together across departments and faculties on issues of global importance. So the, the food GRP has four themes, food and environment, food security, food and health and food cultures. These broad themes encompass most, if not all aspects of food, and we base much of our activity around these themes, but we're also open to other ideas and opportunities around food. So during lockdown, we have been running a series of webinars which have been um, encouragingly well attended. And there is a food GRP mailing list and you're welcome to join this to keep in touch. We're engaging fully with the City of Culture events and particularly in December when the theme will be feast. And again, please get in touch if you'd like to be involved in this activity. And all our contact details are on the food GRP web pages. We'll move on to today's talk. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Suzanne Cleave. Sue is a senior lecturer in public health nutrition at the Nutrition Science and Dietetic Programs in the Department of Nutrition, Dietetics and Food at Monash University in Australia. So for Sue, it is eight o'clock in the evening. She is an accredited practicing dietitian who came to Monash with over 20 years experience working in public health and community as a public health and community nutritionist across a range of settings. Today, Sue is going to talk about harnessing community expertise to reimagine a food secure future, with particular reference to Cardiniasha. We are planning a parallel piece of work in Coventry and Warwickshire this summer, and if anyone on the call would like to be involved after hearing the talk, please do get in touch. There will be an opportunity for Sue to answer questions at the end of the, her presentation, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box at any point during the talk. Now I'm going to hand over to Sue, what I know will be a very interesting talk. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Martine. Hi, everyone. Um, before I commence, I'd actually like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming from today. Um, and I wish to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So um, tonight, well, I'm going to say today, as Martine said, it's tonight here, um, is really to give you a bit of um, an insight into some work that um, we have been undertaking and uh, over a number of years as part of the Monash Warwick Alliance that you'll hear about in a moment. Um, but it's um, this new piece of work around harnessing community expertise that um, I'll really be focusing on. So um, what will we be talking about? So um, I'll introduce basically what is the Monash Warwick Alliance um, and um, the current research that we're doing, specifically in the setting of Cardinia Shire Council here in Victoria, part of Greater Melbourne, where the progress of this work to date and where to next. Um, so in terms of the Monash Warwick Alliance, it is a formal alliance um, between the two universities and um, they support collaborations between researchers from um, the two universities, um, particularly interdisciplinary uh, research. So we can see here we've got um, myself coming from a public health or nutrition, dietetics and food background and Martine specifically in the Department of Statistics. Um, and so as part of this Monash Warwick Alliance um, relationship that we've had, which has really sort of been since about 2015, more formally 2016, we've really been working to try and understand and support action to address household food insecurity. I'm not going to go into the detail that's on these slides, but I really have just got them there so that we're all conscious of what we mean by food security. And by this, I'm really referring to household or community um, food security, so not a um, at a global or a country kind of level of food production, um, and the impact of food insecurity. So um, I think that we've certainly heard that it is this multifaceted issue that impacts on the social, emotional um, well-being and physical well-being of adults and children. It's multifaceted in its causes that are often interrelated. It is prevalent in high-income countries, but it's often hidden. Um, and that has relation to the shame that quite often goes with the experience 
There's a continuum of experience um, that we know um, a exists. But what we do know is that in high income countries that the dominant response tends to be on, and I think I've just lost my slide. Have I lost my slide? Nope, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just going to minimise. Okay, all right. Um, apologies for that. Um, so the current dominant response is around providing emergency food relief, um, which as we know, neither um, prevents nor addresses the, the core determinants of, um, of household food insecurity and is really um, meant more as a, a crisis kind of response for people when they are particularly high in need. So what we really do need is a range of, of, of responses that include food relief, um, but are not only intervention, but policy driven. So as part of um, the Monash Warwick Alliance, what have we achieved to date? Um, so going back to 2016, this is going to be a very quick tour of what we've um, achieved to date. So with the funding, some seed funding, so that was for new and emerging product um, projects. So um, Warwick hosted this forum of taking action on food security. It was really kind of like a bit of a call to action. There are a number of people from a range of countries. And out of that, um, there was a genuine um, agenda around that this is an issue in high income countries. And from that, we've also had some conference presentations. But that was really sort of like the starting point. And there you can see the beautiful photo of um, of some of the attendants. Then, um, so I was very fortunate to attend um, Warwick, um, that, that forum. Then uh, as part of an Alliance Visiting Educator Scheme, Martin came to Australia or to Monash and spent some time um, doing a couple of things. One being was we created this five part teaching series which um, is now used across both Monash and Warwick. So in our undergraduate and um, our postgraduate programs here at Monash in the department, as well as in the Masters of Science, Food Security and Masters of Environmental Bioscience. We also had sort of had a major um, seminar where we were also fortunate that um, Professor Mariana Chilton from Drexel Uni was in the country as well. So we had both Martine and um, Mariana present. So again, that was another outcome. So, and it was as part of this that um, Martine and I started to build on um, some of Martine's work, which is around developing integrated decision support systems and particularly um, around one for food security. And without going into the detail, so this very complex kind of um, determinants map that we've got here is the starting of uh, a decision support system describing the factors that impact on food security status. So as part of Martine's visit, we formulated this um, based on literature, um, based on some experts input, input in terms of some of the core determinants that we were seeing in Victoria at that time as well as running a particular um, where there perhaps is information lacking um, because in these little boxes is all data that helps to support the decisions around what might be potentially the best responses for geographic areas. We recognised that we had um, a bit of a data vacuum in those three areas circled. So we ran um, a um, particular expert elicitation um, uh, session using the IDEA protocol. So that was um, now has now been written up and is in I think the most recent um, uh, release of Public Health Nutrition, the journal. So I think with with this, it was sort of all um, starting the momentum of this decision support. These decision support systems are a way that it can actually help. Um, policy makers or, um, you know, from a programmatic kind of perspective, as well as other broader interventions of what could be the best response to support people in the area experiencing food security. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things um, that we recognised in our work that there was a missing piece to the puzzle. 
So, uh, and that being, um, I guess, community kind of, um, you know, the, the real lived experience and this whole notion of that came from a paper of Mariana Chilton and Danielle Galagos, where calling that we actually reevaluate expertise, particularly in um, food, well, at a number of kind of public health issues, but in their case, they were discussing food security. And that what we need to do is really to seek um, that co-creation to actually understand the issue and not only the issue, but also potential solutions as well. So that was really the impetus of seeing that the missing piece to this puzzle of the work that Martine and I were, were you know, starting to undertake was that around the, the community expertise. And hence, we were successful in 2019 of getting um, a research catalyst fund via the Monash Warwick Alliance to actually do this case-based study across two areas. So Warwickshire County Council, um, but also bringing Coventry into that as well, and Cardinia Shire um, here in Victoria. So um, I'll show you, I'll talk a little bit more about where that is, but basically it's um, um, a large suburb area here in Melbourne. But then with the idea that of 2020, this research would take place, and then, of course, we have had a global pandemic, which has had significant um, impacts for for many people. Um, and um, but certainly in the context of this research, it also had um, meant that it had to go on hold. So we are now just starting to actually undertake components of that. And we've had to slightly modify our initial plans. But what were we planning to do to help to really kind of understand uh, or respond to this question that we had? So what are kind of like the key factors that are impacting on food security? Um, and looking at this from two perspectives, and I've called them parts, but it's really, I guess, having two different kind of um, key experts um, ex uh, understanding. And so the first group I'm going to call there is being community organisation stakeholders. So they may be people who are working or volunteering in emergency food relief, financial counselling, in housing services, across education, local government, or health and welfare, just as an example. The other core group being that, um, so community themselves. So community who are either experiencing food insecurity or may be at risk of experiencing food insecurity. So this um, particular research was planned as, as really like a mixed methods kind of research approach. So it's using a lot of the quantitative kind of components that sit within that decision making support system that I showed you before, but is really enriched with this qualitative approach. And so um, there's two, within these two groups, we've fundamentally got kind of um, both qualitative methods, but slightly different. So with the community member, I'll call them community organisations, um, that has either been either phone interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, or online via Zoom, um, or um, undertaking um, the same core question components, but as a survey online. And that's really understanding what they see um, as certainly some of the key issues around food security. And I'll walk you through that um, in a few slides time. And then a follow up kind of interview or focus group to really present and confirm the findings. The second component being, as I said, the community experience. And so the, the, the parts within this is undertaking a food security questionnaire and then using a methodology of photo voice. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with this as a methodology, it's a qualitative method. Uh, and it's really a very empowering method to really gain, um, uh, I guess, hear communities' voice around particular issues. So the notion is um, community will go and take pictures 
on their phone is fine, of what does it mean to, to access food where you live? You know, tell us what it means for you. And so within these kind of parameters, community can then go and take these photos and then undertake an interview where they tell their story of what the photos mean to them. Um, and then the idea is, is that we'll really then compare and contrast within the settings um, and across the settings with this contributing into that final refinement of some localised models um, of the decision support systems and then getting ready for potential um, piloting for strategy identification. So that's sort of like um, very much down the track. So now I'm going to lead to Cardinia. Um, so it uh, is a local government area and you can see here, so here is the, the Melbourne um, CBD. So it's 50 kilometres um, away from Melbourne. And so it's still part of what, if, um, you know, it's a, 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 a local government area that is um, still called this greater, greater Melbourne. So that's why you're sort of seeing this um, shaded area here. Um, and this is sort of then moving into what you would call either peri-urban or regional areas. It's, so it's because it's on this kind of region, it's called an interface council or a growth council. Um, and it also has a um, strong, um, I guess, peri-urban growing. Um, for those of you, there's always a fun fact um, that's, you know, about Cardinia that I like to share is that they are the growing capital of asparagus here in Australia. So uh, Cardinia is what we'd call, it's a very new or relatively new um, area. It's, as I said, it's a growth area. It's, it's in this, what we call a growth area. So part of the sprawl of Melbourne. Uh, it has three distinct regions. So it has where it says 27 townships. So it's got kind of like 27 kind of key areas or suburbs or, um, you know, town, small town kind of clusters. Um, but the region is broken into what we call the growth region. So that's quite, um, while it's the smallest area, it's the most populated area. Um, and uh, then we have, it, it's called the hills or uh, rural kind of township. That's called the Northern Hills. And then down the Southern area, that's called um, Western Port. So I'll be referring to these kind of terms later on. It's said to be one of the largest um, and fastest growing local government areas in Victoria, but also within Australia, where at least seven families are moving into the area each day. And there is a majority of young families um, with children and um, also a high youth population as well. So that's a little bit about Cardinia. So one of the things here in Victoria, we um, local government areas are required by the state government or legislator to do every three years something called a municipal public health and wellbeing plan. And these are really um, great, um, is a fantastic framework because it actually allows um, local government areas to work on priority areas over a set period of time and then, you know, also potentially um, build on those um, over time as well. So Cardinia is um, seen as quite a, a progressive uh, local government area and particularly progressive in the area of food. So one of the things that they did is um, they produced as part of this it's a longer term vision, this Cardinia's livability plan. So within that, this, these um, health and wellbeing plans fall out of that. But you can actually see they have this, this clear vision. Food um, is there. It's underpinned by um, supporting equity and inclusion for community. Um, very clear about community participation. And with this vision that it's embracing this kind of interface level where we have, um, you know, growth of, of food. You can see the fresh asparagus truck there. Um, we have the availability. We have networks of roads, um, et cetera. But this, um, one of the fantastic things that um, Cardinia have been very progressive 
being that they were one of the few local government areas here in Victoria to actually have a dedicated community food strategy, um, which supports and falls out of this livability plan. And so you can see a very clear vision of what they're aiming, but one of their key medium term expectations is they want to have an increase in access to affordable and nutritious food. So supporting this, there's um, supporting structures in terms of, um, it's called Cardinia Food Circles. So essentially it's a steering group, which um, I'm a member of, but also has key and a number of other key players around the table as well, supporting, um, su not only supporting this strategy, but also you know, certainly contributing um, in their own uh, organisational ways. So I think, you know, here um, it, what I'm trying to, you know, to really highlight is we've got some core underpinning structures here that help to enable some of the work that we've been, under, you know, been able to undertake. One of the things that um, we have been able, and I'm using we very broadly, meaning um, in that role um, in supporting this food strategy, that we've been able to do is to actually collect data um, around um, getting that picture around food security and what it looks like, but also in context of some of the key determinants being food access, availability and affordability as well. So the series of work that I'm about to show is some work that's been undertaken by some of our Masters of Dietetics students um, on their public health nutrition placement. So they need to undertake a seven week placement within an organisation. Um, and so what I'll be showing you is some of this, some of this work. But firstly, in terms of having an understanding, so what's the prevalence of food security? So firstly, I'm not sure for those of you who are not from Australia, I know we do have some people from Australia who are joining us. Here in Australia, our last, um, I guess, at a population level uh, as a nation, it's our last reading being, measurement being um, back in 11 and 12 in a population health survey by um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And because of the form of the tool that we use, it's a single item question in with a follow up question to measure frequency. And it's only measuring the end of the spectrum of experience where if people are actually running out of food and they can't afford to buy more. And I think we know for many of us who work in, um, the, in this space that there is that spectrum of experience. So for us here in Australia, our statistic sits at 4% of our population as being food insecure, but we know it is much higher than that. Um, and there's been some um, indications that, you know, potentially we are sitting more around that 10% and maybe slightly higher as well. Um, so this piece of work was undertaken by Cardinia Shire themselves. And so this was a, um, a survey, so it was a cross-sectional survey that went out to about 2,000 households. Um, and uh, in terms of um, the sampling strategy, and it was um, with the expectation of wanting to, to, to aim to get a, a, around 400 households. So, so I think in the end it came out at um, just shy of three, around 340. But within this, we had some really a comprehensive kind of suite of food security measures to give us um, a much more nuanced understanding of what the prevalence was. Because based on um, here in uh, Victoria, our uh, state government, um, the Victorian government have a Victorian population health survey. But again, um, food security has not been measured in that since 2014. So our, and what we did know is in Cardinia, it was reported again using the similar um, measure as at a national level being around 4%. So what we did here, and this is just, so here, um, just to give you a little bit of a, an, a, as I said, a, an insight. So this port ward is the Western port. The central is that big growth, you know, that big, the smaller area, but the growth area and the ranges is the hill area. So 
just by asking two questions alone, and this is I'm only just giving you this snapshot, we've got much more detailed data, but just looking at these kind of end of spectrum questions, we could see that 14% um, you know, of respondents were indicating that they were worried about putting food on the table as where, where you know, a further 12% where the food that they bought just didn't last and they didn't um, have money to get more. And we could actually show that in certain areas there was slightly higher um, um, indications of food security. A question here that some colleagues um, from Queensland University of Technology have um, devised and it's, we've used it across uh, a number of interview uh, a number of surveys sorry because um, one of the I guess we know that income um, and financial resources is essentially one of the core determinants of food security status but we do know um, that there could be a range of other um, determinants as well so this question has been devised um, and we used it in um, in this survey just to give some other kind of uh, indicators but you can see here that you know the, the these first three are all kind of linked to financial constraints so this one being where there's too many other things to pay for in terms of bills the cost of food and this was consistent with some of that um, state level data and population data that we knew that people in Cardinia were worried about the cost of food. Um, but it, it sort of give, had provided supporting information. And I think where this question has been particularly useful is at a localised level, it can help to understand some of the other range of determinants and also can help more localised responses. So the affordability, so I'm going to show here, so this is again um, using something called the Victorian Healthy Food Basket, which is a validated tool. It's um, 44 food items and uh, including, um, and then based on these specific family types to meet uh, roughly around 80% of um, the nutrient values required um, over a fortnight. And so, what we could actually show here, and Cardinia have undertaken this um, over the last three years, it's typically we undertake it around March, um, and this is highlighting where we're seeing the concentration of um, A, supermarkets being the red and the minor ones here, but you can see what this just raw cost of this basket of food, what this is um, what this is looking like and and essentially what it's showing here is that people in this area here they um, essentially had the higher basket costs we can then actually look at um, this cost according to these different family types and without going into too much detail um, we can actually, anything that's considered over 25% um, of um, income uh, of, you know, going towards the basket is considered food stress. So interestingly, this, if we took, if I showed you this um, exact same infographic from last year, this cost, raw cost of the health, and I'm just going to use the family of four, was significantly greater. Like it was to almost, it was almost, in fact, it was over $100 more for this raw cost. You may ask why. It was because it was right when COVID was starting to play out here in Australia. We, at that time, we were seeing a lot of panic buying. We were seeing um, empty food shelves uh, and core staple items were gone. We were seeing supply chain issues. And also here, um, we had um, in Australia sort of over December, January, been um, experiencing bushfires, which also impacted on um, food production in some areas. So the costs of food had essentially gone up. Um, and what we were seeing for you know for this household who's and this the this 
particular component here, it's totally welfare um, dependent, so not bringing in any form of income. Um, it was over 30%, so it was sort of like 32, 33%. What we're seeing here is some of the, um, this. why we're seeing this change down like this is that here in Australia, in response to COVID, the federal government um, put a number of um, financial mechanisms in place. One is that they actually increase the amount um, of what is called the um, people who are seeking work. It's now called job seeker. Um, so there was a significant increase in that, um, which has now reduced down again, um, as well as they put some coronavirus supplements as well. So. This is important from a perspective of an advocacy more broadly because it's actually showing if we know people have, you know, have um, sufficient or um, income, the difference that that can make. And we have many stories coming out from the Australian Council of Social Service that actually highlight the impact of um, these um, welfare reforms, um, what it meant to people being able to put food on the table. OK, I need to keep moving on. So this is accessibility. So again, this story that we're hearing about food security is that people are having difficult to, you know, to, to access food from potentially from a financial perspective, but also from a geographic location where you live mattered because of if you were living down here, then from a supermarket perspective, there weren't very many options. If you were relying on public transport, the public transport system is great if you're in this growth area. It's not so great if you're down here. And it depends on the direction. Um, you know, there's not a lot that's going across. There's some that's going down, but none of these supermarkets were on um, a public transport system, being a train line. One of the things that we do know is because of where Cardinia uh, is, is that there is a high dependence upon vehicle usage. So again, that's another one of those cost of living expenses that come into play here. And the other thing, and it's taking it back to that same area, is that when we looked at the availability of food, and this is the availability of the items within the healthy food basket, we can actually see that statistically there was a significant difference between um, of Western Port compared to the others. And again, that came back to the, um, the number of food outlets where people could actually um, you know, um, source food. So that's great. You know, we've got this amazing data here that is helping to inform some of the strategies that we've been undertaking. But let's come back to that piece of the puzzle that we've sort of said that's missing, and that's around that lived experience. So this is where um, finally um, we've been able to put the original funding through the Monash Warwick Alliance Catalyst Fund into play. And so it's yet to roll out um, in the UK. But from um, our end, we've started the community organisation stakeholders. So what I'm going to do is just really just give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the findings. And firstly, I'd actually like to acknowledge um, this work has been predominantly undertaken under the super supervision of myself, as well as their placement at educator at Cardinia in terms of undertaking um, some of these interviews and some of the analysis. And I'll um, show you an infographic that they've produced and talk you through the story behind that. So um, to date, we've spoken with 11 community organisation stakeholders from a range of settings. Um, the invitations have gone out to across a number of sectors as you know, from education to housing to financial services. Um, so to date, this is where respondents have come from. And as part of um, this piece of work, it's really trying to get to understand so what they believe are being the, the main barriers um, to being food secure in Cardinia. And do they see any interaction between these um, potential um, barrier or issues? What are the current responses they're seeing? What impacts did COVID had and and really it's also trying to look at so what's the longer term vision what needs to actually happen to make to bring about change and what are the actions that we need to do and who are the key stakeholders 
because one of the other core pieces of work that um, Cardinia are really wanting to do is to reimagine how food relief is provided across um, the Shire. So this is kind of this, um, uh, you know, quite opportunistic that these two pieces of work actually fit really well together. So preliminary analysis. So this again is just um, some very I guess a snapshot and by now there's a lot more analysis that has to um, be undertaken of um, as part of the, the interviews. So the barriers, you know, certainly things like mortgage stress um, at one point, and I'm not sure um, there was one of the highest levels of mortgage stress out in this area, a uh, number of fast food outlets. Um, uh, leading up to one of the major public high schools, they call it, uh, I think it's almost like this um, gateway of leading up to the school of all every imaginable fast food outlet. So the, the food environment is, um, you know, is what we'd almost call a food, you know, a food swamp there. Certainly, um, things like um, adequate income, transportation came up, things around um, people's food literacy. So um, perhaps there was that that um, um, perspective that people perhaps had lost that knowledge of food use as well. But again, what we're seeing is these um, very complex range of factors that kind of interact here. Um, and as I said, this is just the beginning of the analysis. One of the things that was really interesting, um, and this isn't actually the live, there's, this is, um, if I, a live version, I can actually zoom in onto these organisations and um, tease apart the, the different um, factors for these organisations. But this is something, it's a piece of software called Kumu. Um, so what, um, one of the things that Cardinia really wanted was to actually understand, you know, who, what is happening in the whole food relief sector and what are the interrelationships. So this is um, the first kind of take on using that data to actually highlight that there's actually a number of organisations, but there's also a lot of interconnections. So um, if we actually look at, say, for example, the Salvation Army here, we can see that they're using this element legend. They fit as a as a not for profit. They fit as a faith based organisation. They fit as a charity. They've got um, an they've got an initiative network. They have a skills training component, and you can see here in terms of connections. These show the interconnections between all these different organisations um, that may occur. And I think on average, um, we identified that there some organisations had at, at least six, somewhere between six to, nine, six to nine kind of different connections. So this was something that was really important um, to, again, to help to understand the knowledge of where people were accessing um, food relief, but also to understand from the community organisation perspective of, you know, the interactions across the sector as well. When it was seen, um, you know, reimagining this, this future, uh, food secure future in Cardinia, people um, really wanted to, there was a lot of uh, discussion around the stigma, around the need of um, impacting on those cost of living kind of um, um, determinants there, that there needed to be um, uh, this skill, you know, certainly skill supporting skill development, supporting education, supporting employment pathways. Um, but there also needed to be these these connections to the community of Cardinia as well in terms of this within this localised food system, supporting local food growth um, um, as well, but also being very prevention kind of focused. Um, so, uh, so this was some of the story, some of the 
what people saw as the future, but what was identified as this very long-term vision was that there actually needed to be this co-creation with community and sitting uh, and really engagement um, across sectors um, and people coming out of their silos and working with community to actually look at, well, what is the what is our vision and what does it look like? And one of the um, one of the areas that did come up was actually having these um, almost like these kind of I'm going to call it like a hub, but it's where there was very much this integrated um, kind of um, approach to um, supporting some of those and addressing some of those core determinants. And again, this is at a localized level. So this is where I'm going to talk and bear with me because I'm actually going to have to really look at some notes. So as part of um, this, um, the group of students um, actually transformed some of this preliminary data into this infographic that you're, that you're sort of seeing. And while it's about transitioning um, and redesigning and rethinking how we approach um, uh, the way that um, food security or food insecurity is addressed. Um, but it's actually seen very much around um, this kind of very visionary, visionary sort of um, approach. So I'm going to start off with um, what they actually see as um, that starting here on the left side, what we can see is these, these underpinning kind of determinants um, where this side here is um, the very heavily reliant on donations of produce, emergency food relief, um, people caught in these cycles um, you know, for, for long periods of time. And that certainly was evident in terms of discussions, particularly with people who were sitting um, for, in the food relief sector as well. Um, but the because of these kind of core roots or core determinants were not really being um, perhaps either, you know, um, addressed, that this really prevented the growth of, um, of the tree. And so what they then moved forwards that um, they within the middle kind of area was that there's there's really that that time for change and that change is starting to to happen and the seeing opportunity and this connection of organizations working together kind of side by side and the introduction of different ways of so social enterprise models um, co-development co-design and and education as well and with the idea is that it helps to enable greater access to nutritious food and and less reliant on perhaps um, previous um, ways as in the past and the idea here by the tendering to this soil and addressing these that it's actually starting to change the soil underneath and you know supporting growth and new growth um, to to actually move forward that in the longer term that what was identified through the interviews that this systemic kind of network of support that expands from local government right through to state to federal as well that it you know it really is everybody's business um, and that initiatives that potentially could actually be identified through these would support um, people within the community who were experiencing food insecurity to really um, thrive and be supported um, um, to to you know having this 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 environment that really um, supported that as well and really the aim here is really dismantling that whole kind of network of um, Factors here that certainly did impact um, on on people's access to food and ability to put food on the table. So I just wanted to to really to finish to highlight that this was a way that they had envisaged this story that they were hearing um, through the interviews with um, with 
some of the community stakeholders. So where does that leave us now? So from the Cardinia perspective is that it's really finishing off some of those final stakeholder interviews um, and to, to add to that picture. And then with the view that we'll actually start um, doing the second component with community members. But I think one of um, the take home messages that was very clear um, across many of those people that um, the, uh, the student group spoke to as part of those stakeholder interviews is that we really don't want to see people stuck in the same spot in five years time that they really wanted to to um, support um, and work with community to envision that future so that is it from me so i'm going to stop screen sharing and because for the whole time i couldn't see anyone um, so I'm going to do that and then I can see people. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sue. That was absolutely fascinating. So at the moment, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat. So while you're thinking about your questions, um, I'd like to start. I really liked the Kumu map with all the different organisations who are involved in various different ways. In, in addressing food insecurity. Can you can you just say, were there any new insights that uh, came out of that mapping exercise? I think, um, I think from a uh, council's perspective, they didn't really have a full appreciation. I mean, they knew, certainly knew that there were a number of people on the ground doing the work, but I think not, having that appreciation of all those connections that were happening um, across um, across all those different organisations. And granted, I mean, there are some um, platforms within, um, within council that um, as a group they do come together, but I think it was really that first kind of that, I think it was that visual thing that made the difference is like, yes, you can say, well, we've got a list of X, X Y and Z is in this area doing this, um, but this actually helped to show the breadth and the depth of interactions. Would you say there's any opportunity for coordination based on the mapping that allows, for example, somebody working in one region to have needs met in another region in that kind of collaborative way? Either through yeah physical goods or, or some other services or perhaps something like that? Yeah, I think some of that is, it depends on the organisation, Martine, and I think some of that, um, from my limited understanding, is already happening. Um, but I, again, as I said, it depends on the organisation and, you know, where their reach is. But I know that there are some services that might, because let's face it, you know, just because we live in a certain area it doesn't mean that we, um, you know, we may access services outside of that and et cetera. So, yeah, so I think there's always opportunity. Excellent. Uh, Rosemary, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, so, sorry, it wasn't um, very well typed in the end. Hello, Suzanne. Um, I mean, this is probably a, a naive question, but, but how, I mean, it, a lot of it seems to be due to poverty. Um, mm. in the initial answers. So how much difference do you think solving the poverty issue alone would would make? Because um, it does seem key. I think, I mean, I think we, we do know that, as I said before, that essentially that is um, adequate income, adequate financial resources is really the primary driver. If we could actually impact on that, then we... She's frozen. Uh, we've, yes, we've, we've, we've lost you momentarily, Sue. Okay. We okay? You're back now? Yep. Yes. Okay. We're back now. Um, that uh, just by that example of showing by increasing, well, those social welfare reforms um, during COVID, the impact that that had for people, um, it was significant amounts of money that actually lifted people who were solely reliant on um, social welfare um, out of poverty, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think, you know, the thing is, is recognising, so with this piece of work, it's 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 recognising that, yes, they, they are still the core drivers, but there's also at a localised kind of level, some of these areas that we can certainly still work on to support. But, you know, and that's where, you know, essentially we've got to have this very much this tiered approach that needs to come right from, you know, from, in our case, from, you know, federal government down to state government, down to local government. It's, it's everyone's business. I think it's true to say, isn't it, Sue, that they had a, a sort of almost a natural experiment in, in, in Canada because one of the states reviewed its welfare policy and food security really dropped. But there are still those local mm. factors about actually the expense of getting to the shops to still take into mm -hmm. account. Um, yeah. Yes. So I think that that was a bit of a clue. And I think we've seen the same here. We've had a, a welfare uplift to do with to do with COVID. And although food insecurity is going up, it's not going up as badly as it might have done otherwise. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Caroline, yeah. would you like to ask your question next? Hi there. Thanks for this talk. It's really interesting. Um, I was wondering, because I work in um, food security um, in, in East Sussex in England, and um, there are sort of some contentions over who leads on the organisation of taking this work forward and the sort of action plans, that, um, you know, to sort of yeah, take the work forward. So I was wondering what your experience is of this and who normally leads um, on this sort of work, the collaborative side of things. Yeah. So just to clarify, do you mean in the context of this piece of work, kind of like who's leading it or do you, or are you thinking more broadly in terms of the response? Uh, I actually meant more broadly in terms of the response, yeah, yeah because you've got the map of all those organisations that are all working um sometimes in silo although obviously the work that you're doing is to try and bring those things together and that seems to be happening across the, the world actually um where you've got sort of local place based um but someone somewhere needs to lead that overall vision so I was wondering yeah. what your thoughts were on that yes I agree I mean I think um that's the thing is that there is this groundswell um and there is a lot of you know, a lot of work that is happening on the ground. But I think, and I'm going to talk from, um, you know, the perspective here in Australia, that there needs to be the recognition that this isn't just, you know, this isn't an individualised, you know, kind of response. This is, um, you know, we need sort of major reforms and we need um, to actually really properly address this. And I think... One of the things too is that if you don't measure it, then you really don't know the extent of the problem. And that's part of the problem that we have in this country um, is that we don't actually have a good handle on the experience, you know, from a, from a, uh, from a national, you know, that kind of big kind of um, prevalence, you know, like you look at within the States and with Canada having regular monitoring. And I know in the UK that that's, that's, happening in terms of the rollout of a more much more detailed um, um, you know understanding of food security so there's a lot of us that are advocating for that change um, that we need to have much um, much better measures and and that's certainly going to help in terms of how we respond to it but um, but yeah Unfortunately, right now, it's, um, as I said, the most recent um, um, national data that we've got is from nearly 10 years ago. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it did resonate with me a little bit about the, the difference between the, um, the social model and the medical model of disability. You know, whose problem is it? Is it the individual or is it society's problem? You know, are we disabling people or, or forcing them into food insecurity by the way we do use our planning laws, our planning regulations, our use of land, um, you know, wanting to make houses more and more valuable all the time so that nobody can buy one? This kind of idea. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. So certainly, you know, it is it's not it's having that um, multi strategy kind of approach to it. And, you know, that multi tiered approach within the multi-strategy too so that it's from you know from a national level down to the local level as well thank you joe would you like to ask your question 
Hi, thanks, Sue, for very interesting uh, data. One of your slides show the average distance to food outlet. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could explain a bit more how you uh, calculate the average distance to food outlet. Sure. Yeah, so that particular slide, that's based on data. Um, there's a group out of one of the universities here called um, at RMIT and they there's, um, it's called the Urban Observatory. And so they have um, these, within this um, suite of tools that they have, um, so in, in the case of Cardinia, they've actually bought the rights to access for their localised data. So it drills it right down to um, uh, um, what we call an SA1 level, um, so which is basically down to about, you know, sort of 200 ha odd household level. And so what that that is kind of then so they literally it's measuring so where are the shops in relation to the density of the living so um i'm more than happy to provide martin um later with a link to the urban observatory or if you google urban observatory um at rmit and that you will be able to see um, not only do they provide um, information on food, there's a whole range of kind of other kind of um, pieces of information that are very useful to, to local governments uh, in terms of their planning as well. Thanks. Thank you. We had, we had a student do something similar for Warwickshire. So in the UK, uh, postcodes are a lot more granular. Uh, so they, they encompass about 50 houses and, and by using the postcodes of the shops that you could kind of approximate the location as a centroid yeah. postcode and, and he yeah. did some work on that here. So yeah. Carmen's question she'd like me to ask. Um, so how this how how might this research be translated into long lasting policies? Um, so in, in the UK context, that would be a universal benefit. Uh, and a universal basic income and uh, a mental health uh, support services, for example. That's um, a really so. Just to clarify, so you're talking in terms of some of the more the community voice aspect, or more the um, integrated decision support system that Martine and I are working on. Um, so I think I think that the, the sort of the work on food security in general. Um, um, so we've got new insights coming from community members. We've got new insights coming from um, community organisations. So how yeah. would those yeah. insights yeah. then translate into? Yeah, into I think. Businesses? Yeah, I think one of the um, as as we've highlighted, one of the core missing pieces of the puzzle at many levels it has been that voice of community and the voice of people you know certainly experiencing and the power of of that um, we know can actually be quite profound but I think it's also having being opportunistic in terms of and also within the timing and the work that we do is in with in advocacy and also allowing those opportunities for people to knock on doors. Um, and as an example, um, someone who's done very well in in this piece of work around advocacy is Mariana Chilton um, in the US with the witnesses to hunger and and how women um, have actually gone to Congress um, to actually present their experiences. So I think it's um, it's it's finding yeah it's finding those opportunities and I and I don't know from well, I'm I'm assuming from your perspective as well in the UK that COVID has actually um, really shone a light on this as an issue, and has presented this as an opportunity that potentially we can actually now strike and um, really try and bring about change or work towards change. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if that's answered your question, but. <laughs> Thank you. Hugh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, hi, Sue. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, hi, hi. Hugh. Uh, how are you doing? Um, 
Yeah, I'm just interested in that. You know, obviously, uh, Australia and 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 UK Western Westernized world, and there seems to be a dominance of of big businesses that play an enormous part in availability of food and delivering of food at, at reasonable prices. But um, there seems to be a stranglehold, though, on 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 um, what they can do and what the, and the power that they have to you know in in the sense of wanting big business to prosper at mm. the expense of people being in poverty uh, i'd mm. just like to hear some of your thoughts if that if that would be okay yeah i mean i think certainly here in um you know in australia we have a duopoly of within the retail food retail um so well it's primarily a duopoly in terms of we have two big major players um in the field um and but then we also have um, some other smaller players as well as independent kind of grocers as well. Um, so I think it's, it's, and that's something that within Cardinia and the support of um, some of the partners that are around the table are really keen to actually um, work with supporting uh, as I said before, because we're in this, you know, this gross peri peri urban area, that really supporting local producers to um, their with them in terms of their production, but also in terms of their retail as well within this kind of localized environment and that whole thing of that you're um, you're shopping local, you're eating local, um, that sort of thing as well, and I think. Um, for this local government that's and I know there are a number of other um, local government areas here in Victoria that are really working on supporting that that local that local food production and sort of you know really trying to start to look at alternative models um, beyond you know some of you know having an alternative beyond some of the big players one of the um, one of the uh, responses in this area and uh, in another couple of areas within Melbourne is a social enterprise model who produce, who have um, a market um, which is um, available to anyone and everyone. Um, it's where there's about six um, markets around at different um areas within Melbourne there's one in Cardinia in that Pakenham in that um, which is in that big growth area and there people can get culturally appropriate foods quite often it's um, within locally sourced but it's um, could be anywhere between 40 to 50 percent um, the retail value when we've looked at the costing of what you would get in a super, local supermarket but the delivery of this is, you know, it's in such a unique way. It's impacting on, you know, social participation, social connections, um, and and really tailoring towards the niche of those local food environments as well. So that's an alternative model that um, is, is certainly gaining strengths here um, in, in Melbourne. Thanks for that. That's really good. Thank you. Um, Joshua, you have a nice question. Hi, thank you. Yeah, um, the talk was really interesting. It's really nice to hear a perspective from a different country. Um, I had a couple of questions. One of them was kind of, did you face any barriers or challenges when you were engaging with uh, local stakeholders in your research? And were they fairly receptive to what you were doing? Were they willing to get engaged or were they sort of a bit apprehensive of kind of more research going on? Um, that's a great question um, because I think the thing is, is you know, when we're working with, you know, undertaking this sort of research, it's it's not about research for the research sake. And and I think one of the things that has um, before actually approaching people was um, the opportunity for me to go along to one of the, their meetings uh, where I said a lot of the stakeholders come around and, and sit around the table. So I was actually able to go and um, and talk with them and and really, I also not you know came came at it very much not so much around research but talked about my experience you know having been grounded so much in practice of working on the ground for you know over twenty years before I moved into research. 
so getting them you know providing them with that that sense and I think um I, you know I'm not going to lie certainly recruitment has been challenging um and um but again that's been you know for a number of factors I think it's really uh, primarily just a lot of these people are volunteers there's, you know, one, you know, if there is a paid position, they may be doing the work of a number of people and it's time. And so that's why I've really tried to kind of, we've really had to try and pivot in terms of while ideally I wanted this all, to, and because we can actually do face-to-face -face here now, <laughs> um, although as of today, we've got to have our masks back on because we've had a community cluster outbreak here in of COVID um, here in Melbourne, but um, we, like we've had to try and use pivot and try and use different methods. So we've had to use online, you know, people could answer it as a survey, exactly the same questions. So recognising the limitations of that, you know, perhaps the, you know, the information may not be as rich, but it was still a way that we could reach out and engage with people um, as well. So I think there is that genuine willingness um, of people wanting to work together and people recognising that this is an issue. We know that we're working, you know, we're working, we're doing the best that we can address it, but we know that, uh, as that quote said, you know, we don't want to have people, the same people sitting here in five years' time. I think you've kind of illuminated some of the challenges that you face. we face in the UK doing research as well. It's uh, often these kind of organisations you're trying to engage with are incredibly overstretched currently. Mm. Another yeah. thing on top of that, it can be problematic. But I like the point yeah. you said about kind of getting involved and getting your perspective across and kind of building that relationship and trust. Um, yeah. I've got time. Can I ask a second question? That's yeah. right. I'll, I'll hand it over to Martin. It's fine by me. <laughs> it's fine by soon. It's fine by me. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about part two, engaging with community members. Yeah. Um, how were you planning to conduct that research? Were you going to follow a similar model than you, that you did with the stakeholders or were you going to try something different or...? Yeah, so that's, um, it'll probably be a bit of a, um, a multi-pronged approach. Um, so we'll certainly be recruiting via some of those community organisations, um, also via uh, some of the connections within broader, within the broader um, council, so within, um, as in council, as in cutting near the organisation as well. Um, with connections um, through um, some of the um, some of the schools, reaching out to families that as as well. We've also got um, through ethics. We've also got not only you know the traditional we've got flyers, but we've also got social media capacity as well. So via um, the various Twitter handles for. Um, so within Cardinia, there's also, while I said there's um, the Cardinia food circles, which is more sort of like the steering kind of um, part of the steering kind of group to support direction. There's something called the Cardinia food movement, which is um, more community member um, who are directly involved in that and supporting the activities. So via their... Um, uh, networks and um, social media will be also recruiting out that way. So it's, it'll be a bit of a, as I sort of said, a multi-pronged kind of approach and we'll see. I, like, I, I mean, I just don't know. It's I think it's really hard to predict right now how people are going to respond. Um, yeah, so we'll see how we go. That's yeah. the plan anyway. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, and we're trying. We're going to be following on slightly uh, in a, uh, behind in in Coventry and Warwickshire. So we're ready now. We've got our ethical approval. We're ready to start recruiting um, community organisations to do the survey online, or if they prefer um, over the phone or face to face uh, interview questions. Um, and then after that, we'll be looking to to act, to um, engage with community members either through those organisations or, as Sue has said, uh, social media and so on. Um, to try and get their voices in. So the hope is that we will get extra insights into uh, the problems, the drivers, but also the potential solutions, isn't there? Because there's nothing like having some lived experience um, to actually say, well, if only they did this. And, and as, as Sue alluded, uh, Mariana Chilton's uh, photo voice um, methodology in the States threw up some most unexpected dimensions, which um, 
led her to be able to uh, devise a, an intervention for food insecurity, which did not involve giving people food, food. which was yeah. very, very interesting. Anyway, so we have worked you extremely hard tonight for you <laughs> and this morning for us. Um, thank you so much for a great presentation and audience. Thank you so much for really, really great questions. It's, it's fabulous to have such great engagement with mm -hmm. this project. Um, to remind you, get in touch if you're happy, if you're happy or willing or wanting to be involved in the Warwickshire and Coventry uh, section of this um, research. Also to say that our next webinar is on the 24th of June and Dr. John Ingram from the University of Oxford will be talking about enhancing food system resilience. So uh, do get onto the food GRP mailing list if you're not already and you fancy having uh, details sent to you of that. So um, thanks again to Sue and all of you for joining the event and I hope you'll join us on the 24th of June. Thanks everyone. Thanks for your questions and your time. Thanks Martine. Bye.